Okay, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today to present the audits of the Anti-Cancer Drug Administration Nursing Competency Audit, which is a big mouthful. Anti-cancer therapies play a significant role in cancer treatment. However, delivery of these agents is complex and there's a high potential for harm. As has been already addressed this morning, several significant events reported in other states highlighted the need to review safety and quality measures in the delivery of chemotherapy in Victoria. The department undertook a statewide survey in August 2016 to review governance and processes around the prescribing and delivery of chemotherapy. It identified a range of areas for improvement and some of the work to address these issues will be presented later on today. Chemotherapy is delivered by nurses who have completed appropriate training and have been assessed as competent. For the purposes of this presentation, chemotherapy refers to the delivery of all systemic anti-cancer therapies. To better understand the quality and safety measures and risks that exist in Victorian chemotherapy services, the department, together with Safer Care Victoria, conducted an audit to collect information about policies that support the administration of these agents by the work nursing workforce. A number of policy documents were reviewed to inform key areas to cover. All chief executives of public and private health services in Victoria re were requested to complete the audit in June 2017. Areas of interest included organisational capability, policies and processes around education and training and competency assessment, 102 services returned their survey, a response rate of 91%. A total of 69 health services, including 32 metropolitan and 37 regional, reported that they currently provided a chemotherapy service. As the audit relied on self-reporting, services were asked to provide supplementary evidence, for example, policies or procedures in place to guide practice. There is a large variation in the numbers of episodes of chemotherapy delivered by services each year. The high volume services, delivering more than 5,000 treatments per year, are mostly in metropolitan areas. Regional cancer centres have been established to allow patients to be treated closer to home and to support smaller health services in the delivery of cancer care. Key findings from the audit show that all services follow policies for reporting and managing adverse events and near misses. All services have access to resources in the clinical areas. Variation exists between high volume sites and lower activity sites in the following areas. Policies on minimum standards of education and training, including how assessment and ongoing assessments of competency is managed and recorded. Delegation and assessment of competency. Capacity in nursing education departments to assess nursing competency. Requirements for specialised education and training in the safe delivery and handling of anti-cancer drugs, including waste management. And access to specialised education and training courses, rather than in-house, unspecified or no specialised training. 95% of health services reported policies that required nurses to undertake specialised education and training in safe handling and delivery of anti-cancer drugs. Most nurses have completed the EVIQ Anti-Neoplastic Drug Administration course, or the ADAC course, as it's familiarly known, which provides accessible online learning and assessment, supported by a clinical skills workshop conducted locally by staff who have attended an ADAC facilitated training workshop. A further 17% reported that nurses in their organisation had completed the ADAC course, as well as the Peter McCallum Cancer Centre Module 1 and 2 courses, which include safe administration and ongoing management of cytotoxic drugs, including side effect management and patient education. And 7% 7 of, 7 of health services said that they used the Peter Mac course only. So that's a big change over the previous years. In-house courses were more likely to be used in reg regional settings, with educational support provided to smaller sites by regional cancer centres. And competency may be assessed by nurses in formal education roles or by senior clinical nurses within oncology units. 
A number of services indicated that they would review policies um, on receiving the audit. Um, and some of these were frequency of competency assessments and the development of an education plan for both medical and nursing staff in non-oncology areas. The audit has shown that there's clear communication from organisations to provide high quality services to individuals facing treatment for cancer. Results of the audit were presented at COSA in 2017 and another outcome of the audit has been the planning of today's forum. So we thank again all the health services who responded for their willingness to review their practices and to participate in the survey. Thank you. Uh, my throw on Eugenia. From, oh, okay. I know your, you know, the data's come in, but from your sort of first cut, if you like, in looking at the data, do you think there are some obvious things coming through around, from a nursing perspective, how do we support the ongoing competency beyond that initial training of nurses in such a rapidly evolving area of care? And that's somebody had put that question from the floor as well, I think. Well, I think uh, ongoing professional development, so using EBQ, using EBQ on a daily basis to look at uh, different regimes that are coming through, um, being a member of CNSA, being a member of COSA, uh, attending professional forums. A lot of the um, pharmaceutical companies have a great deal of information also on the newer agents that are coming through, the immunotherapies, the other targeted therapies, so just continually being uh, aware of updates and using every opportunity. Uh, and that education has to be not within, just within the unit get, delivering the chemotherapy, it's educating the nurses in emergency where patients are going to present to, uh, educating nurses on the wards where patients will go when they've um, been admitted with adverse events. So it's including everyone in that education. Thank you. Oh. Uh, so, Gina, um, do you think the audit was more about training provision rather than uh, competency assessment? The audit included training as well as competency. Um, there's, well, EVQ suggests that uh, competency be looked at every perhaps one to two years. That's not, I believe, set in stone, but there is a EVQ um, module for uh, reviewing competency. Um, the audit was just a start and it was really, I, I can see from the results that came through, it's really got people to reflect on um, many aspects of their uh, policies. Um, and we only, I only <clears throat> presented a few issues of the audit today. There, there are many more areas where people are really looking at, at governance and um, training. Um, so, did I answer the question? So one more question, and I think we'll call it a day because it's actually gone crazy now. Um, so in the auditing phase, uh, what information was gathered uh, to ensure the content delivery and competency assessments were done correctly? Can you repeat the question? Sure. In the auditing phase, what information was gathered to ensure the content, deliver, the content, the delivery, and the competency assessments done were done correctly? Well, we couldn't measure that because that, it was a self-reported audit. So we were asking if, you, if there were ways of uh, measuring competency. And so that was really whether the organisation said, yes, they're um, deemed competent through uh, completing the online modules and from uh, achieving, a, a, you know, being seen as competent from their face-to-face um, uh, -face, uh, uh, measurement of competency. Um, we, we can't measure that. But that, again, that's something for organisations to look at themselves of who's measuring the competency and how. 